Hi, and welcome. I'm Alana Johnson with NASA's Office of Communications, and we're here today to provide you all with an update on our Psyche mission. We'll have some quick opening remarks, but we're going to try to save most of the time for Q&A. Uh, presenting today, we have Dr. Lori Glaze, the Director of NASA's Planetary Science Division, Dr. Lori Leshen, Director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and Dr. Lindy Elkins-Tanton, the Psyche Mission Principal Investigator. On the phone, in case we need some extra questions, we also have Henry Stone, the Psyche Project Manager. When we get to the question and answer portion, media, you may press star one at any time to get into the queue and ask a question. And with that, I will hand it over to Lori Glaze. Thank you, Alana. So I'd like to start things off today uh, by communicating that following exhaustive analysis, augmentation of resources, and efforts to rescope or rephase functionality, the project and JPL have concluded that Psyche does not have a path to launch with acceptable risk in the 2022 opportunity, which runs the launch opportunity, which runs from September 20th through October 11th. So the project and JPL um, have brought this information to NASA headquarters, to NASA Science Mission Directorate, and the Science Mission Directorate agrees with the project's recommendation and has directed the project team to stand down on the push-up to launch. Uh, we're giving the team a moment to take a breath and regroup um, and then uh, analyze uh, what potential launch opportunities um, are available in uh, 2023 or 2024. This type of decision, of course, um, as you all are familiar uh, or, or know, this is not an unfamiliar decision uh, for NASA, and nor will we make any decisions beyond this uh, without an extensive assessment. Uh, there will be an independent review to assess the path forward uh, for this project, for Psyche. Um, and a decision based on that assessment will be made in the coming months. That independent assessment team will be made up of experts from government, academia, and industry. And uh, they'll review all possible options for next steps, um, including the uh, estimated costs uh, for each of the, the various uh, possibilities. As part of that decision process, we'll also, of course, include uh, the implications and discuss the implications for NASA's discovery program and for the planetary science portfolio at large. Um, all of that will be considered as part of that decision process. I wanted to also note that we are, of course, uh, very aware that SciSci is not the only project that's impacted by this decision not to launch in 2022. Of course, the Janus mission, which is uh, one of the Simplex missions uh, to fly two spacecraft, the two binary asteroid systems. Um, that mission was scheduled to launch with Psyche as a ride share, as a ride along. And of course, the implication here for Janus is that um, it will not be able to launch since it was scheduled to launch with Psyche. Um, and the implications, the future implications for Janus and that project will be considered once we have a clear path forward for Psyche. We also recognize the Deep Space Optical Comm Technology Demonstration, or DSOC. That project um, is already integrated onto the Psyche spacecraft. And so, again, as part of the Psyche mission, um, is also impacted by the decision not to launch um, during that contingency window in late September and early October 2022. This has been an incredibly tough decision to make um, by the team, by JPL, and, and by NASA headquarters as well. Um, and I really want to acknowledge my appreciation for the incredible efforts of the entire Psyche mission team. Um, their hard work in delivering that spacecraft hardware to Kennedy Space Center on time, they've worked so hard to do that. Um, it's an incredible achievement. And then the efforts just in the last couple of months to really better understand uh, this uh, software verification challenge has been um, Herculean. So we really appreciate their efforts. I wanted to note that despite the need to make this decision today on Psyche, I want to stress that NASA remains fully committed to scientific discovery and exploration of small bodies. Um, this is exemplified by our existing missions of Cyrus-Rex, Lucy, and DART. 
and uh, we are uh, anxiously anticipating the, um, the review of Psyche to, to better understand what that path forward will look like. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Lori Leshen to give you a little more information about what, this, what drove this decision. Uh, thanks, Lori. Appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the, the success of Psyche, of the Psyche mission, is our top priority. And as you know, planetary missions have a tight launch period, and Psyche is no exception. That's driven by the alignment of planetary orbits needed to get the spacecraft to Psyche. Uh, so we had a tight launch period, and we have run out of time for the 2022 launch opportunity. The high-level uh, description of the problem includes a it's, it's a challenge with the software for the guidance, navigation, and control system. I will warn you, we may slip into GNNC, that's guidance, navigation, and control system. So the software for that system, it really needs to be thoroughly tested to ensure that the spacecraft can successfully reach Psyche. It's very important that that work well. The software has been delivered. But the issue is the time needed to complete the testing and the validation of the software. We had some challenges getting the, what is a very complex guidance, navigation, and control testing environment operating effectively. And that is also now fixed. So those challenges we faced with the testing environment are also now fixed. But we do not believe we have the time to complete this essential software testing and validation to make the 2022 launch period. So again, because we're confined to a tight uh, planetary launch period um, where we can't miss it even by you know, a short period of time and reach Psyche. So I just want to acknowledge the dedication and the incredible creativity and, uh, of the Psyche team in trying to solve this problem, as well as the broader team here at JPL who have been brought to bear uh, to help understand where we are and help creatively think through a possible alternative paths forward, which Lori already mentioned. We augmented the workforce with key expertise, um, stood up an institutional tiger team to help support them. We looked for creative ways um, to potentially parse the work and even defer some of the testing until after launch to see whether we could still make this window. We have um, looked at many, many options, and even with a very aggressive adjustment, we did not feel confident enough that we would reach this, that we would successfully reach this window with a mission that we were confident to fly. And that's why we came forward with the recommendation uh, to headquarters. I also really want to acknowledge the, the DSpace Optical Com, the DSOC team, and the Janus teams. I know this will be difficult news for them to hear as well. Um, and of course, delay is very disappointing. But it is the right decision to ensure the Psyche mission is a success. At JPL, we are committed to work with NASA on the options for a path forward for Psyche and to work with the independent review team and learn from this moment as we move forward. And with that, I'm going to hand off to our PI, Lindy Elkins Tanton of ASU. Thank you, Lori. I am so proud of the Psyche team. This team has worked extremely hard to overcome many challenges but we just ran out of time on this one. The spacecraft hardware is largely complete and we were on track to support a 2022 launch. We have no inherent deficiencies in the design or the ability of the spacecraft to accomplish the planned mission. And in fact, we have no known problems with the GNNC software. We just haven't been able to test it. So we have today a beautiful functional spacecraft built and ready but there is that one challenge we couldn't overcome in time to launch in 2022 with confidence. We've just had insufficient time to verify and validate functionality associated with the GNNC uh, software and the fault protection and to fix any issues that we would then find during that testing. These are critical path items. We've overcome so many issues, issues of hardware and software, and of course, the challenges of all of us humans during the pandemic, but the one we couldn't overcome was the lateness in the GNNC uh, control software. So we knew it was coming in late in 2021, and in early 2022, we also understood that the test bed, which simulates the spacecraft, was also not working correctly. So additional experts were added to help. We have fixed the test bed largely, 
but only recently did it become clear that time would just be too tight to reach the 2022 launch period. The team has investigated all options and made extraordinary efforts. The team is made up of so many heroes in the best sense, working so hard. We have also had excellent, clear communications and support right up through Marshall and NASA headquarters every step of the way since selection in 2017, and I'm very grateful for that. We will do what's needed, and we'll work with NASA on all options moving forward. Thanks, everyone, and uh, let me hand it back to you, Alana. Thank you, Lindy. We'll go ahead and get into our Q&A now. As a reminder for our media, you may press star one at any time to get into the queue to ask your question. And our first question comes from Seth Borenstein from the Associated Press. Go ahead, Seth. Yes, thanks. And actually, I have, I have several. The first, can you tell me how late was the software um, coming uh, how late did it come? Who made the who? Who is the contractor for the software? Will they be? Will there be a penalty on them? How much will this add to cost? And is there a chance that you just will not launch this thing? Okay, I think I'm going to give that one over to Lori Leshin at JPL. I'll start, and then I think Lori Glaze should answer some of the programmatic questions. Um, so, JPL is responsible for the flight software. And JPL is, is the mission management here, and so we take responsibility, you know, for the mission. Um, but, but this was flight software that we built uh, and look forward to, to testing and proving for launch. The, the test environment itself is really a blended environment between our spacecraft provider, Maxar, and JPL test environment, and that we did run into some challenges there as well. Um, in, and so we look forward to working with headquarters on an independent review of, um, you know, of the late delivery and the testbed issues and understanding uh, exactly what happened here so that we can make sure we improve for the future. Lori, do you want to, Lori Glaze, do you want to take the, the questions about cost and, and options? Yes, I'll, I'll take them, Lori. Um, and, and Seth, thank you for your question. Um, so if I, just to repeat, uh, there was a question about will there be a cost increase and a question about um, the options. And uh, to, to answer those, uh, as we've stated, there will be um, this independent review of, of the project um, to understand what the various options are going forward. As I said, we will look at um, all options. Um, and as we're looking at all of the potential options, we will uh, weigh and, and understand what the implications are of each potential op option uh, to uh, not just the Psyche project, but to the discovery program overall. Of course, Psyche is, is one of our discovery program missions and to the overall planetary science portfolio. So we will be looking at, uh, at what each of those options, uh, uh, what, what the results would be in, in each of those areas. Um, and as, as far as cost, um, that will be evaluated, again, as part of that uh, review process, that continuation or termination review that we will, we will run um, to look at all of those options. I, I, and how okay, late thank you. Uh, next question is going to come from Elizabeth Howell at space.com. Oh, hello. Uh, this is Elizabeth from space.com. So I just wanted to really follow up and make sure that I understood this correctly. So uh, Dr. Glaze, when you said all the possible options, is that up to and including a possible reconfiguration of the mission or even a cancellation of the mission? Can you give us a bit more clarity on that point? Sure. Um, we are, when I say all options, uh, I know that the team are going to come forward with some potential alternatives, and I don't want to second guess what they're going to be. I'm sure that some will be looking at different launch opportunities. Um, we'll have to see what they bring forward and, and what, uh, what cost estimates go along with that. They'll be reviewed by an independent review board, um, those options. Um, but then we will also look, as I said, at across the board. This will be a continuation termination review that will look at that, the results of the independent review and the recommendations put forward by the project. Um, and that assessment will be made looking at um, the, the whole range and the implications for, uh, for Psyche, for the Discovery Program, and for the planetary portfolio. Okay, thank you, Lori. 
Our next question comes from Jeff Bout with Space News. Hi, I wonder if you could elaborate um, on exactly what this test bed is um, that's required for the software testing. Is it is it hardware or software, some combination thereof? And is that provided by JPL or, or by Maxar? Who has the responsibility there? Thanks. Lori Leshen. Yeah, thanks. Um, I am actually going to throw that to, to Henry Stone, our project manager, who can uh, explain it because it actually is complex. And the answer is a combination, and it's a combination of providers. But Henry, why don't you jump yeah, in? Yeah, hi, this is Henry Stone, uh, and a good question. Uh, the test bed uh, is basically a, a splayed out uh, simulation of the actual spacecraft. It's a combination of hardware, uh, software. It's some of the hardware is replicating the exact elements that are on the spacecraft itself, like the computer brain, compute element, et cetera. It has EM or prototype versions of various portions of the hardware that's on the actual spacecraft hooked up and exactly then wired together the same way. But it also includes a whole bunch of electronic uh, uh, EGSE, electronic uh, uh, ground support equipment, uh, and simulation, software simulations of various devices uh, that you can't have replicated uh, in, in this test environment. And it's intended to make a replica of the flight system onto which you can then run the software uh, to test out all of the system behaviors. And in the case that we're talking about here, the guidance, navigation, and control system behaviors. Um, the hardware and the software elements, the many pieces that go into that are uh, fundamentally the responsibility uh, uh, JPL. The test beds are located at JPL. A large portion of them are built and uh, designed and implemented here at the lab, but it also includes portions that come from Maxar, our main spacecraft provider, uh, because uh, many of the GNNC related sensors and actuators that are on the spacecraft are provided by Maxar as part of what we call the uh, solar electric propulsion chassis bus, right? And so we had to merge their por that portion of simulators and test equipment with the portion at JPL to create the overall uh, system. And we ran into some, some issues there. Uh, one example had to do with some time synchronization. I know that's pretty detailed level. Uh, but that was giving us some problems and not allowing us to get the GNNC code itself uh, to start running smoothly so we could do the formal checkout uh, necessary for flight. Okay, thank you, Henry. Our next question comes from Marina Corin with The Atlantic. Hi, everyone. Uh, two quick questions. Um, for Lori Leshen, has JPL seen the software issues that you're dealing with on any previous planetary missions, or is this a completely new problem? Um, and for Lori Glaze, you said you're doing a continuation termination review. Has that process already begun in a formal capacity? And can you share which factors could potentially push NASA to move towards termination? Thank you. Okay, let's start with Lori Leshen. Thanks. No, we haven't had this, uh, this exact problem before, and especially the unique challenge of the testbed environment. Uh, and, and again, that's one reason we're really looking forward to an independent assessment um, about how we got here so that we can learn from this moment and, and make sure that um, we take those lessons going forward and improve for the future. Lori Glaze, over to you. Great. Thanks. Um, and thanks for your question, Marina. Um, so we have made every effort to communicate to you as quickly and as promptly as we possibly can as soon as we made a decision to not launch in 2022. Uh, we want to be as open and transparent with our information as we possibly can. So at this point, uh, the answer to the question about has the review button process begun is no, because we are just now making this decision uh, not to launch in 2022. And the very next step um, after we've caught our breath um, this afternoon, I'm sure we'll begin uh, the planning process and putting together what that review uh, will look like uh, and what materials will be uh, will be part of what types of information will be part of that process. And uh, the decision uh, that will come out of that process, I want to make very, very clear right now, as of right now, today, there is no decision um, one way or another in any direction. 
Um, we want to make sure that we come into that, uh, that continuation review uh, with an open mind and that we're in there to listen to all of the information that comes, uh, that is presented. Uh, we'll look at the whole breadth of information. Um, we'll discuss amongst uh, the science mission directorate and other uh, stakeholders uh, within NASA to understand what all the implications are of different decisions before we make any decision going forward. Thank you, Lori. Our next question comes from Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. Thanks for doing this. Um, this is a question to follow up a little bit, uh, on some more technical detail of the uh, software uh, test bed. Uh, is there anything particularly complex about this particular mission, you know, given the interaction interfaces between the Maxar and the JPL components that does make this software testing more complex than it would be for, you know, a purely Maxar or a purely uh, JPL in-house mission. Just to talk about some of the additional complexities, if there are any, for this mission. And also, what's the plan with the spacecraft? Is it going to be uh, remaining in storage at KSC during all of this, uh, all these reviews? Thanks. We'll start that with Lori Leshen. Thank you. Um, I I'm sure there are some some unique aspects to this. Um, this testbed environment, that's one of the reasons why we want to have the, uh, the review team really look at that. Um, you know, it's a real advantage. It's been a real advantage to work with a commercial bus provider like Maxar, and we want to learn from that so that we can continue to collaborate with commercial partners in the future. Um, I can ask Henry if he has any uh, particular input on that, but before I do that, I want to just address your second question, which is, this team has been 100% focused on making this 2022 launch opportunity. So things like what exactly will happen with this um, physical hardware, the spacecraft that's at the Cape now, is work ahead, and we will we will share that when we have it. But we we don't have that plan yet. We don't yet have a mission plan that that um, for later launches. Although we're starting to get some information that there are later launch opportunities possible, even in 2023, um, and so. There's a lot of uh, work to do here to flesh out the plan forward, but we wanted to share this information about the 2022 opportunity just as soon as we had it, as Lori Gleit said. Henry, would you add uh, one or two tiny details on, on the complexity? Yeah, St Stephen, I think you're right. There, there are some unique attributes of putting, merging together uh, a testbed that's comprised of elements that are architected from our historical testbeds here at JPL in combination with portions of the Maxar, their test environment. We only needed portions that were not inheriting the whole thing, right? And putting those two together that were architected obviously poses some interesting interface uh, uh, challenges and work. And uh, I think the investigation that going forward will uh, help to determine if we made any fundamental misses or, or things in there. So and the only other thing I would add is, you know, this this mission also has a unique mission profile, which is fairly soon after launch, about 70 days after launch, it needs to begin thrusting for its it, with its solar electric propulsion system. You know, unlike a Mars mission, which might have two years after launch before it actually arrived at Mars with a fairly straightforward cruise. Um, so you really do have to make sure your, your guidance navigation and control software is, is working and fully on its game um, at launch. And so we really didn't even have much time after launch to think about, say, deferring some functionality and things. So that's another unique aspect of the mission itself that um, made it that much harder to, to meet this launch window or launch period. Thank you. Our next question comes from Irene Klotz from Aviation Week. Thanks for Lori Glaze. Um, what happens with the Falcon Heavy? Does NASA retain ownership of that launch opportunity and could you use it for something else or, um, and if, if uh, I keep up not flying, um, does NASA get a refund on what it's already paid? Thanks. Thanks, Irene. And again, I'm going to come back to we're sharing this information as soon as we have it available. There are still a whole list of questions that we have on our list that we need to address. Um, and we will, we're going to start ticking those off as quickly as we can. And the launch vehicle.
Ethical is one of those, although we have spoken with LSP, they certainly are aware uh, that we will not be launching um, in the Sept September 20 to October 11 uh, launch period. Uh, so they are aware of that, but we have not started those discussions yet um, to know what the next steps will be. Thank you. Uh, I, I will just say that uh, LSP was not able to join us today, but if you do have a question on that, uh, Irene, go ahead and send it in to us and we'll field it to the right people. Our next question comes from Kenneth Chang with New York Times. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is for Lindy and Henry. Um, I was just wondering, when did you start realizing that this was going to be a serious time crunch? Um, I was out at JPL in April visiting the spacecraft just before you shipped it, and it sounded like everything was on schedule and there was no major problems. Yeah, hey, Ken. Um, I, just to, to reiterate, we did know that the software was coming in late in 2021, and we began to understand we had these test bed problems in early 2022, and we were very carefully monitoring all these using all of the usual metrics for these kinds of things, and we were still confident we were going to make it. It was only just very recently that it became clear that we were not going to make the launch period. So, um, so I, I appreciated talking to you when you came to see the spacecraft, and uh, that was the information we had at that time. I don't know if uh, Henry wants to add any some, anything to that. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just state I think that was the case, and, and clearly the spacecraft itself was was ready to go and on on track. Right, this is testing activities that are not performed directly on the flight vehicle itself. Um, so we we felt or believed that we had at the time a path forward to be able to uh, you know overcome the challenges that we were working at the time. Um, but uh, it regrettably did, did not play out as uh, we had hoped. When between April and June did you realize that everything was changing? Um, I mean, it, it, yeah, it, ahead, was, it was evolving kind of all the time and, and ramping up. We were taking many, many different mitigation options, um, and it was only until very recently uh, here that we concluded that uh, you know the time time was ru running out to perform the testing. Again, I'll go back to what Lindy said. We know of no known issues with the GNNC software itself. It's it's the matter of being able now with the test beds running to have the time to do that final checkout to you know to to validate and make sure. Okay. Thank you very much. Our next question comes from Alex Witsey from Nature Magazine. Hi, my question is for Lindy. Uh, is this GNC software kind of custom built for Psyche? Are there legacies from other spacecraft, um, or is this a one-off thing that's unique to this particular mission? Yeah, parts of it are unique to Psyche. We share a lot with, uh, with, with Clipper and other parts of this software. Um, there might be more that Lori wants to add. Uh, I think you have it right. It's it it is based on legacy, but but there are also unique aspects. So it's both. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes from Marcia Smith, Space Policy Online. Oh, no. uh, thanks so much. I do understand that you're still looking at what possible launch windows, what opportunities you have in 2023 and 2024. But can you talk just a bit about where Psyche is? Is it something that you know ordinarily you can only get to once a year or once every two years, or can you get there every six months? Just very generally speaking, and the yeah. same for Jan Janus. You know, what, what are the options for Janus? Do, do do they have other spacecraft that they can ride along with? So, Lindy, why don't you go first? Yeah, yeah. Let me just uh, kind of say a couple words about that because, of course, this is very much on our minds. Um, Psyche takes uh, just under five years to go around the sun. So, depending on when you want to launch, the Earth and Psyche can be in quite different um, positions relative to each other. The the key aspect that we need to hit with Psyche is that we arrive when the lighting is good because Psyche's spin axis lies over in the plane of its orbit. So it's or it's it's spinning like a rotisserie chicken instead of like a top. And I mean that in the most respectful way, a rotisserie chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and so you want to get it when the equator is, is 
getting lots and lots of light so we can take all the great pictures that we've already set up the pipeline to send them right out on the internet within a half hour of our receipt. We're so excited for this to happen. We certainly hope and trust we'll still have our chance. And so that's what the trajectory team is doing right now, is making sure that we can find those times when we arrive when the lighting is good. And it will say that we do have very good indications that there are some excellent opportunities in 2023. And, and I would just add the electric propulsion design of the spacecraft means that we do actually have um, a lot of flexibility with launch opportunities. So there are good looking opportunities in 23 that get us there before the end of the decade. And we're, we're looking at those, um, we will be looking at those in great detail and uh, over the coming weeks. Right, and, hey, and Marcia, well, I was gonna go ahead, answer Marcia's second question, Alana, if that's okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, and, and Marcia, thank you for asking about Janice as well. Um, so uh, let me just point out a couple of things. So you, even when we shifted uh, the Psyche launch to the contingency window from August 1st out to September 20th, um, it was clear that the Janus mission would not be able to necessarily uh, do exactly the same or visit the same targets that they had originally proposed. However, the team have been incredibly innovative and have, you know, are able to have done a lot of work. And, and by having an alternate launch opportunity, we're able to identify additional targets where science could be conducted. So I feel like um, we will be able to find a way whenever we launch Janus. Um, to reach some interesting science targets. As far as what the path forward looks like for Janus, um, I'll just reiterate that uh, our first objective right now is to uh, address the plan forward for Psyche. We'd like to complete uh, that continuation review, com complete the independent assessment of, of how we got where we are today, look at the various options for Psyche, and understand what that plan looks like um, and understand what uh, what the, the uh, outcome is of that continuation review. Once we know that, we will be able to think a little more uh, uh, completely about what, what the path forward for Janus will look like. And keep in mind, of course, Janus is a Class D mission, which means that uh, we uh, are kind of pushing the envelope and, and taking a little more risk uh, with, with that type of uh, that type of mission, uh, they're lower cost, higher risk missions where we're trying to lean, lean in a little bit. Um, it's a ride along, so it's a bit subjective to what happens to its, its primary. Uh, so we wanna understand what's happening with Psyche before we make any decision about what's gonna happen with Janice. Thank you for the question. Okay, thank you. Our next question, uh, we're gonna start circling back now. Seth Borenstein, Associated Press. Thank you, and I, I'm sorry to harp on this, can you give me a specific or at least an estimate on how late the software delivery was? I know it was from JPL. Was it how many weeks or months or years late was it? Um, it just helps to find that. And, and is there someone? Yeah. Is there, or, yeah, that, that, gonna, yeah. I would say it was several months. Several months. And which Lori was that? That was Lori Leshen. Sorry about that. Yes, I, sh I should have identified myself several months. And again, we're going to have an independent look to validate exactly what happened with the schedule here and, uh, and really come to understand it and the reasons why. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now, go ahead and ask your question. Thanks for taking another question. Um, can you, uh, maybe Laurie Leshen or Lindy can talk about um, when in 2023 these launch opportunities are. Uh, just to follow up, I think it was Marcia Smith earlier asked about how often these launch periods uh, mm. come up to, with a proper alignment. So how many are there in 2023 and when, when is the first one in 2023, for example? And the timetable for this independent review, you know, when do you, when do you want to get those results to be able to proceed in, into that termination slash continuation review at headquarters? Thanks. Lori, shall I take a quick answer on the, sure. on the launch opportunities? At the moment, we have a, a nice opportunity in July and opportunity in September. Um, it's because of the nature of electric propulsion not being like chemical propulsion, 
it's not quite as easy to say as there's like with Mars, there's this 26 months, you know, repeat. And it's not the case with Psyche. It's more complicated. And so uh, there isn't a regular repeat number that I could tell you. It depends so much on the re relationship and space of the different planets. And so that's why we have these unbelievable genius trajectory people. Uh, so I, I think that's my, my answer on the trajectories for now. There's a lot more work to go. Yeah, and then this is Lori Goyes. I think your second question had to do with the timeline for the review. Um, so from, uh, from our perspective, for, for being able to uh, execute that uh, continuation review, as you can imagine, we'd like to get that done as soon as we can so we have a decision. However, I also want to make sure that we have all the, the best information available in order to make that decision. So we do want to make sure that the team has sufficient time to assess these complex trajectories you just heard Lindy talking about. Uh, they need time to, uh, to flesh those out and really understand uh, how viable those various opportunities are. Uh, they'll need to uh, assess those and then uh, uh, provide or, or develop uh, cost estimates associated with those. Um, and so there's a lot of information that still needs to be gathered. That said, uh, I really, we all would like to come to a decision as quickly as we can. So we'll be working closely with the project to develop that timeline and, and better understand exactly when, when that decision can be made. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ken Kramer with Space Up Close. Hi, thank you for doing this, and I really hope you uh, you work this out. It would be a shame to not launch this. Um, my question is, uh, yeah, the follow-up launch windows, how, how does that mission, that, how does the science compare in 23, 24 to, to what you would have done uh, this year? And I'd also like to know, uh, how much time would you have needed uh, in order to launch it this year? How many more weeks or months? Thanks. I'll give that over to Lori Leshen. All right. Well, I'll start. I, I would I would have Lindy uh, address the science question, but I think the answer is we're going to get the same great science, but Lindy should validate that. Um, so, again, the launch uh, period is pretty unforgiving, and once you realize that um, we, we – once we realized we, we really, given all of the different options that the team worked through, that we were not going to make it, that, that's really the important thing here. Um, we absolutely believe that we should be in a good position to make a launch window in 2023. So, you know, it's weeks to months is the answer to your question. Yeah, okay. that's exactly right there. And I would say about the science that, um, that we absolutely expect to get all of the exact same excellent science. So that's really good news for us. There's no reason to think that the science would be degraded in any way. Would it be different? No, to be exactly the same. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The next question comes from Bill Harwood with CBS News. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, hey, it's a, an unpleasant question, but one I wanted to ask anyway is, is what does it cost you guys per month to keep the spacecraft on the ground past the launch date? I, I assume that's for Lori, but maybe, maybe not. I'm just curious. I realize you don't know how long it's going to be on the ground yet, but, but what, what's the cost to extend the mission, to store it and keep it safe and keep the team working? Thanks. Thank yeah, you. And I think, go ahead, Lori Glaze. Yeah, this is Lori Glaze, and I was going to say, I don't have that number at my fingertips. I don't know if Henry has it at his fingertips, and if not, we can certainly get that for you and, and get back to you, Bill. Thanks for, yeah. I mean, there, so this is this is Lori Leshen. There are, you know, there are what several hundred people working on the mission right now. Right. Obviously, the key right now is to really work through that plan forward to understand what the cost of of um, extending the the time until launch and then of the, the sort of new mission design uh, of the you know post launch mission will be. And that's our job in the coming weeks and months is to. Uh, is to put that plan together. In terms of specifically about storing the spacecraft and how much that will cost, we don't have that information yet. We, we would have to, once we have the plan in place, we can share that. Thank you. Our next question comes back around to Marina Corin with The Atlantic. Hi, um, yeah, a question about the launch opportunities. Since it sounds like there might be some in 2023 and 2024. Um, I mean, those seem kind of right around the, the corner, especially cosmically speaking. So 
I'm wondering why NASA feels the need to conduct a continuation termination review right away. Is this type of review just standard procedure after any kind of mission delay, or is there something different about Psyche that's driving this? And this I'll is let Lori Glaze start with that. Yeah, I'll, I'm happy to take that one. Thank you. Um, Yes, so having a, a continuation review or continuation slash termination review is standard practice uh, when there's a change, particularly if we're looking at additional costs or changes in schedule that are significant. We do always want to make sure that we bring that back to NASA, to uh, the decision authority, which is Thomas Zerbuchen, uh the uh, Associate Administrator for Science uh, at the Science Mission Directorate, um, so that we have an opportunity to uh, really assess Stuff all of the information and make sure we're making the right decisions. Um, so that's it is standard practice. It's something that we we always do uh, if we're going to make this kind of an important decision. Uh, so so that is like I said, that's part of the process. Did I answer all of the question, or was there more? Uh, no, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Next question is Ken Chang, New York Times. All right. Thanks for taking another question. So I think I heard that the test environment is working now. And so this is sort of following up on Ken Kramer's question. Is it weeks to months just what you expect this process to take between um, if everything worked perfectly the first time or, or what you expect for a standard debugging of GNC software? Thank you. Yeah, this is Lori Lesh, and I'll take that one. It's, it does have some assumptions in it about uh, standard debugging for sure. We, we would never expect testing of flight software to go perfectly the first time. That's why we test it. Um, however, we have there, you know, we, we haven't completed those tests yet. So um, again, until we actually get into the, um, you know, fully into the test, we'll, we'll see if we run into unexpected problems. But we, but again, there are no known issues. We just need to work through the tests of the flight software for the guidance, navigation, and control system. Okay, thank you. We have Jake Robbins from the We Martians Part Podcast. Hey there, thanks for taking my question. I just wanted to follow up with Marina. I know that a, a review after a, a delay would certainly be uh, obvious and prudent, but I'm wondering if they're always independent. Um, you know, did Insight get an independent review or curiosity for that matter when they missed it? I wonder if there's a specific reason it had to be independent. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, so we generally, when we do reviews, even during uh, the regular uh, key decision points, we have the standing review board that takes a look. Um, and uh, and then periodically for, for special reviews, we can bring in an independent review board. Um, I can tell you that with this associate administrator, um, uh, there have been uh, multiple opportunities where we have brought in independent review boards to look at things, and I know that that is, is his preference. Thank you. Okay, and we have uh, time for, oh, actually, I think just dropped out. I think we, are, we have exhausted all of our questions today. Uh, I'm sorry that if if we've run out or if we didn't get a chance to answer your question, uh, please do reach out to the PAOs on the release and the advisory, and we will do everything we can to get you a response, work to get you a response. And we'll also direct your attention back to the media advisory for the playback information of this media telecom. And with that, we will say thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to the media for joining us and have a very great afternoon. Thank you.
Oh, 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 oh,